Did you notice in the songs this afternoon uh, how many of them had to do with uh, holding the Christ's hand in some way or being led by the Lord? Well, it sort of introduces, if not directly introduces, what I would like to talk about this afternoon. And it's biblical authority's relationship to love. In 1 John 4 and verse 8, John says to us all as Christians, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You've heard me speak many times as well as other people speaking concerning the corruption of the idea of especially agape love as is discussed by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That is the highest form of love, always seeking another's highest good as the Bible directs us and defines that highest good. But there's something else that needs to be understood, and that is that Christianity is the religion of biblical authority as well as that of love. Throughout the years, many people have tried to set love against authority and authority against love. But it just won't work if you rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. But it does show that the subjects of biblical authority and biblical love are timely and crucial. They always will be if one's to be truly converted to Christ and understand how to live as the Lord wants you to live in his church. Or even to become a member of the Lord's church, to become a Christian. But this study is especially significant to churches of Christ because at present, and for many years now, within the body of Christ, the biblical principles of authority and love and their relationship to one another are being challenged and rejected by some. There always needs to be, if nobody understands about them at all or there's no special effort to corrupt them, what the Bible actually teaches about them. But sometimes it's even more important. I say again, men have corrupted the biblical doctrine of love. So I want to spend this time in studying love's relationship to authority as revealed in the Bible because you cannot be led by Christ if you do not understand the relationship of God's love for us, our love for Him, and the authority of God in Christ Thus, my basic affirmation is this. The Bible teaches that the only way to yield to God's love is to yield to God's authority. And that, therefore, the love principle never rises higher than the authority principle. Now, I say that because... The false concept of love leads people to believe, well, God will let me get by with things. I don't have to submit to the will of heaven. In our society, submission is a bad word. Except to those who make it a bad word and they expect you to submit to them. But we must conclude from the totality of the Bible's teaching on love's relationship to authority that law and love are never, and let me underscore the word never, law and love are never mutually exclusive in the Bible, nor will they be in the devout disciple of the Lord's life. We will now, first of all, and I'll offer three passages of Scripture, but first of all, we'll go to our first proof, which is set out in the 16th chapter of Luke, Luke 16, Luke 16. We'll begin with verse 19 because this is the account of the death of the rich man and Lazarus and they're entering into the Hadean world. Verse 19 tells us about the rich man and describes him how a rich man would be described in those days. And verse number 20 
tells us about Lazarus, who is about as poor as you can get and about as sick as you get. And you see he's so sick, he desires the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, verse 21. And he only had the dogs to come and lick his sores. He's in such a terrible state of affairs. Then verse 22 tells us the beggar died. And you know, it didn't end there. He didn't go out of existence. He didn't cease to be conscious. He died. And James tells us the body apart from the spirit is dead. So therefore, there was a separation made. His spirit left his body. And notice, it was carried by the angels of Abraham's bosom. Now let's stop right there and remember that the Lord gave this account of these two men. And they're two Jews and they approach God in the Mosaic dispensation through the law of Moses. So as he teaches, he teaches as to a faithful Jew and one who's not faithful. And so you see the rich man also died and was buried, but then, and in Hades, or the King James says hell, the place of departed spirits, the Hadean world, that he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thy thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they that would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. I pause here to point out, obviously this is not at the end of time the destruction of the world, because people are still living back here on this earth, and this lost rich man in torment remembers his brothers who are back here and can do something about where they're going to wind up. So the world continues. Thus it establishes there is a place for departed spirits that are to be withheld or held until the end of the world and the destruction of it and the resurrection and the judgment where all men receive fully their rewards for what they did here, the faithful going to life eternal and those raised to damnation being sent to eternal hell. So this is a place of departed spirits called the Hadean world. And you may say, well, why didn't they say in the King James Version, Hades in verse 23? Because the word hell had different meanings in it in those days, and it does now. That's why. Hell meant an unseen place, as well as the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment. And that's the way they translated it. So it's not a poor translation. It just not... It just does not cover the development and the evolution of the English word hell as it's come to us today. So hell today in most of our terminology means the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment. But it didn't necessarily mean that in those days. A hellier was one who covered the roof of a house and hid the roof of it. And you even could say in those days that they held their potatoes by putting them into a place to keep potatoes through the winter and covering them up. So that's why in the original 1611 it has hell. But today it's better to say Hades because he's not talking about the final abode of the wicked. He's talking about the place one goes who dies right now and is not prepared to meet his Lord and that's where he goes, where the rich man went, and the saved one goes where Lazarus goes or went. So we'll look a little further here as I finish this out. I'll pick up these last few verses before chapter 17 in just a moment. Now I mentioned that our basic affirmation is that the Bible teaches that the only way to yield to God's love is to yield to God's authority, and that therefore the love principle never rises higher than the authority principle. And I directed you to our first proof that I've been reading to you. And I remind you this is our Lord's own account 
of the rich man and Lazarus, two Jewish men who died and whose spirits went into the Hadean world. Their authority for their conduct was the law of Moses because they were Jews. Now, when you look at verses 24, 25, and 26, you see the poor, sad condition of that tormented soul who did not live as God directed him on this earth. And if I held the view of some people concerning love, then I could just hear some of them, and I might be saying the same thing, accusing Abraham of not having enough love for this poor man. Now I want you to get the picture and let it form in your head. The Lord expected us to understand these words, and he draws us a word picture so we can understand it. A man dies, he dies lost, and his spirit goes in the Hadean world into what is called Tartarus, the place of torments. Now what do you find about this man? Well, in this case, he sees Abraham, who has always been selected as the prime example of faithful, loving service to God. Now, they're not in the material world anymore. They have no physical body. They're not in a material world. Don't ask me how you can recognize people and all of that kind of thing. But they did. And it's even more interesting that the rich man recognized Abraham, and yet Abraham died hundreds and hundreds of years before the rich man. So, so things are vastly different there. But the spirit can be tormented because Jesus told us about a man and the man himself commented that he was being tormented and he asked for relief. For I'm tormented in this flame. Have you ever noticed the calm, logical discussion of these two people and yet one of them is tormented in this flame? Let me ask you something. If you saw somebody right now, or any of us here, and that person was engulfed in flame, would you walk up to him saying, have you got a problem? <laughs> Do you need some help? And if he begged you for help, would you say, got yourself into this? Nobody problem but your own. You chose it. Here's the consequence of it. That's exactly what's going on here. Listen to the conversation. He asked not Abraham, but for Abraham to send Lazarus. Now, he knows where Lazarus is. He knew Lazarus. He had no time for him on this earth. And so, he says, I just want this man I wouldn't have a thing in the world to do with. He had to be a filthy character. Physically. Had to have sores all over him, dog licking his sores. He said, would you send that man over? I don't mind him now with his finger dipped in water to touch it to my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Now watch the response of Abraham. He just wrung his hands and he squalled and bawled and said, I'm so sorry. He says, son, remember. That thou in thy lifetime had thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. Now here's the fact of the matter, and beside this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Have you noticed? There's no emotional thing involved in this. There's no, why did God do that to him? He made his own bed and he had to sleep in it. According to some's corrupted view of love and kindness, and tenderness and mercy, it would seem the love, that love would demand that Abraham yield to this poor, tormented man's simple request. Some people even teach that God will do anything to save a soul. Listen, will he? 
People forget that this life is given to us to prove to God we love him, that we'll take him at his word and act upon his authority for all that we do. For that's the way you walk by faith and not by sight, since faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This man proved that he wouldn't do that. He had all of his life, however long or short it was on this earth, and he was blessed with much this world had to offer so that he's called a rich man. Yet he dies unfaithful to God. And the consequences are this. You put yourself where you are, and no amount of love would save you. If you look in verses 29 through 31, where I finished reading a moment ago, and Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You know what he's saying? These five brethren still back on this earth who could believe and repent and change their lives, not come to where you are. You say you don't want them where you are. They have the wherewithal not to come. They have Moses and the prophets. Well, that means they have God's word. Just like you did. Well, he seems to remember they must be treating God's word just like he did, and he knows where they're going to go when they die. Or he wouldn't have made this plea. Because notice his attitude still is not to submit to God's will, not to let God have the final say, because he says, verse 30, No, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now think about this for a minute. Why are where you are? Why are where you are? Why are you there? You wouldn't do what God told you. Remember what we said last week to fully obey God? You wouldn't do what he said. You wouldn't do it the way he said it. And you wouldn't do it for the reason or in some cases more than one reason he said it. You're there because you chose to be disobedient and to live your life contrary to the authority of Moses and the prophets. God's word. You put yourself where you are. There's no passing the buck. Life was given for you to live in the flesh and thereby to prove to God you loved him or you didn't. You had faith in him in his system of salvation or you didn't. And you proved you didn't in either case. And then, very logically and plainly, Abraham says to him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. Now here's where the point's made in proving this being our first proof of love always submitting to authority. Here where everything is done just like God wants it done, what do we have? It should be emphasized that love yielded to the authority of God's word. It always does. So when somebody comes along and says, well, if you just loved so much, you'd bend and you'd compromise and you'd this and you'd that and get your emotions all wound up in it. Well, mind you, these folks aren't in a body any longer and they're not in this world any longer. They're in the place of departed spirits. And here is the father of the faithful, always pictured as that in the scriptures, the epitome of faithful service on earth. And there he is speaking to this man who would not believe and obey God. No special treatment. But he wanted special treatment. He wanted Lazarus to be sent back to earth and warn his brethren. And he said, Abraham did. Well, if you raise him from the dead and he goes back and testifies to all this, they're not going to believe him. That's basically what he said. You know... There was somebody that was raised from the dead to die no more. And I don't see all the world running over themselves to believe him. And he's the one that gave this. And the point that's made here, among many points that are made, is that love always submits to authority. And anybody that comes along telling you it doesn't, just remember, Abraham, the rich man, Lazarus in the Hadean world. Now, turn with me over later. 
We'll come back to Luke a little later on. But right now, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. Remember, he wrote this to Christians. These people heard the gospel. They believed it. They're converted to Christ. They've been added to the church. They're God's people. They're Christians. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. John's instructing Christians here. Now, they already knew this, but he's instructing them more. 1 John chapter 2, 3 through 6. This is my second proof. 1 John 2, 3 through 6, verse 3 reads, And hereby we know. That's nice. I can know something. John, inspired of the Holy Spirit's writing words, so we can know. We can be instructed. We can have our feet put on solid ground. Hereby we do know that we know him. Well, I like that. That sounds solid. But it's conditional. If we keep his commandments. Not hard to understand intellectually. But he's not through. Look at verse 4. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now, I don't care what he looks like or she looks like, or whether it's your father, mother, son, or daughter, wife, whoever it is, husband. That's what it says. It covers everybody. Remember, everybody's somebody's child. Remember that. I am, you are. And that means to some people, we're more special than to other people. They're familial relationships. Doesn't change a thing though, does it? When it comes to authoritative position of the objective word of God. Then watch verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word, what happens? In him verily, now verily translates the same word in which we get amen. Amen means so be it. He's saying in him so be it is the love of God perfected. What's perfected? What's perfected by keeping God's commandments? Love of God. And then notice he says, Hereby we know that we are in Him. Now the point that I'm making is that law and love are never mutually exclusive in the Bible, nor will they be in the life of the disciple. And the affirmation that I made is that the Bible teaches that the only way to yield to God's love is to yield to God's authority. And that therefore the love principle never rises higher than the authority principle. Now what did John say? John inspired of the Holy Spirit. John, the apostle of love, writing part of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, his Lord and our Lord. Now, to best understand the importance of the verses I've just read as it relates to our study, I simply ask the question, you've heard me ask this before, and I'm sure others, I hope you've asked yourself this question. How do we show our love to God? What did John, what did John say? By keeping his word. And he says, a person who says, I love God, but will not obey him. What did God say about that person? He's a liar. Lies deceive. We talked about being deceived this morning. Lies deceive. They're falsehoods. They're not on the same par with truth. Never have been. So the apostle John answers the question down here in verse 5. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. Well, in him is where the Lord's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1, 3. From the gospel, we learn how to get in to him. The believer who's repented of sins and confessed one's faith in Christ to be the Son of God is baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ. Galatians 3 and 27. That's the only way, only doorway to get into Christ where he's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, being saved from your sins, sonship, the hope of heaven, all being those blessings, some of those blessings. So the only way we can love God is by loving and obeying his word. People tell me they love God and they go about not to abide by the authority of Christ, our Savior, the only Savior, the way 
the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Well, that may upset a lot of folks because they would be the same kind of folks if they were in Abraham's place, and they could do it. They would turn around and try to get the rich man out of torment. You ever thought about that? By what authority would you move, even if you thought you could? Why would you want to get the rich man out of torment? Think about it for a minute. You know more than God does. Why would you desire to get the rich man out of torment? Why wouldn't you respond to the rich man's plea just like Abraham did? Are you better than Abraham? He's the father of the faithful and held up his exemplary faith. Well, I remember a time he was told, Take thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest, and offer him a burnt sacrifice. Would you? But he said about to do it immediately. And the only reason he didn't is God stopped him. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, he already had in his mind that God would raise up Isaac from the ashes of the altar. That's how he had worked out in his mind. Abraham knew that God couldn't keep his promises, that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. If Isaac was left dead, he worked out in his mind, well, God's all powerful. He can do what he wants to. I'm going to obey him, and I'll offer him a sacrifice. God can raise him up and go ahead and perform his promises. That wasn't the way God chose to do it, but you can see Abraham was trusting God that he would take care of his end of the bargain if he would be faithful and obedient to him. And so Abraham, over where God's will is done to perfection in all his life, he lived so he could be there, for he looked for a city whose builder and foundation was, founder was God. Now, he wouldn't have argued. He didn't argue. He simply said, you put yourself where you put yourself, and you're getting your just desserts, and God's made it that way. It'll just have to be that way. I don't think that we know how to cause people sometimes to realize if you go to hell, it's your fault and it's nobody else's. You had time on this earth to show God you loved him and you keep his commandments, and that true love always leads you to obey God's will. Think of the songs we sung when I started this sermon out. Asking God to lead us and hold to God's hand. Why well, do you do that? Just by having a warm feeling toward God? Or does it mean take up your cross daily and follow Christ? Does it mean forsaking everything else, obey Christ? Does it mean going to the cross if necessary or being stoned to death or whatever it might require? False doctrine, so-called neo-Pentecostal experiences and all kinds of uncertain sounds never, never, never express love for God nor respect for the authority of His Word. So let's say with the Apostle Paul that all that really matters is the keeping of the commandment of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. Remember, it was inspired Paul who charged the young preacher Timothy to keep the commandment without spot, without reproach. 1 Timothy 6, verses 13 and 14. And then, of course, it was Jesus who said to his own apostles, If you love me, American Standard Version 1901, Ye will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So I emphasize this point. No level of love nor spiritual plane ever transcends our submission to the authority of God's word and the letter of his perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25. Never does. You can talk about how much you, oh, how I love by my law and all that. But if you don't do it, you can sing it all day long. Now, let's turn back to my third and last point. That is proof. And that's found in Luke 18. Back where we were just a couple of chapters over. Luke 18. And look, we'll start in verse 18 and go through verse 25. Luke 18, verses 18 through 25. Now, while you're turning there, I want you to realize this about this, pa this passage. Herein is found the record of a man that Jesus Christ, the only Savior, could not save. Let that sink in. This is the inspired record of a man that Jesus could not save. 
Now, let me point this out to you. It was not because Jesus did not love him. For in Mark's account of the same thing, Mark 10, 21, Mark tells us, then Jesus beholding him, loved him. But it's still the record of a man Jesus couldn't save. Neither was it because Jesus lacked the power to save him. Notice what's said of Jesus in John 17, 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. He loved this young man, and he had the power to save him. But Jesus couldn't save him. And that's because this young man lacked one thing. It's very simple. He refused to obey Christ. Now, let's look at the thing here just for a moment. In verse 18 reads, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Now, in doing that, he's saying, You're confessing me to be God. So you're going to get an answer God would give you because that's what I am. And being Jews, living under the law of Moses, he tells them the commandments here. Now the young man says this, and inspiration records accurately what the young man said. Whether he did what he said or not, I don't know. But he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. But inspiration gives us accurately what he said to Jesus. Now, Jesus is listening because the scripture says in verse 22, when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And immediately people said, Well, you mean I've got to give up everything, even the shirt off my back, before I can be a faithful child of God? You missed the whole point. Let me say that again. If that's your view, you missed the whole point. What our Lord's saying is that you can't let anything of this world come between you and completely obeying me. And since this young man had lots and lots of money, more than most had, then he knew right where to go to get to the crux of the matter. Notice when the young man heard this, verse 23, he was very sorrowful for he was very rich. People will read those two verses together. Very sorrowful and very rich. They like to read it and see very rich. They don't look at the very sorrowful because of the attachment one has to riches. And in this case, there you are. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, Jesus saw that. He said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. That's an exclamation mark there. For it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of, of God. Now, the point we're making is that the love principle never rises higher or sets aside the authority principle. It always leads one to obey God's will. We've already seen that Jesus loved him in Mark's account. He tells us that explicitly. We also see from John 17, 2, that Jesus had the power to save him. But I still say here's the record of a young man Jesus could not save. This young man lacked one thing. I've said it already. I emphasize it again. He refused to obey Christ. And all the love that heaven could give him, and all the love people who wanted him to be saved could give him, couldn't save him. And here's why. Having spurned the authority of Christ, Christ's love could never save him. The whole denominational world rejects all of that and tries to figure out a way that I can go to heaven without obeying God. Even when you have explicit statements of Hebrews 5, 9, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. They still try to figure out a way to get around obedience. 
Even when you have an Ecclesiastes, what's the conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. There's what the Old Testament said. There's what the New Testament said. Now, what do these examples I've given you from Scripture say? That love, true love of God, always leads one to obey God. So submission to the Lord's word in many areas does not provide one with the license to set it aside in even one area. James was writing to Christians. And James said, For whoever soever shall keep the whole law and stumble in one point, he is become guilty of all. James 2 and verse 10. You may attend all the worship periods there are. You may read your Bible daily and pray. But when you're gathered, let's say, for example, in this assembly of worship, and you don't worship God in spirit, though all the acts are in harmony with God's will, you sin. Jesus said worship to be acceptable to God must be in spirit and in truth. You may have your mind on God. You may be thinking about him. But you may engage in an act of worship that has not been authorized by God. To act without authority of Christ is a sin. Or that verse up above my head means nothing and you might as well just throw the whole Bible away. Love of God and love of godly things, the word of God being one of them, always leads a person to obey the truth. So deeds done by sincere people but done without the authority of God's word can never be done in love. Because love, true love, always leads one to obey God. If you say love God, you love God, and you won't do what you know the Bible commands you to do, you do not love God no matter what you say. And that's what John was saying. Remember Hebrews 6 verse 8. Titus 1 and 2 says it's impossible for God to lie because of the very essence of God is truth and his attributes are truthful. God cannot lie. Man's often wrong, but God's always right. And that's basically what Paul meant. He wrote the Romans, Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, let God be true but every man a liar. To live outside the authority of of God's word is to live outside the power of his love. And you think of all three of these I've just given you, and love will always lead you to obey God. I think probably this is one of the greatest dangers of people who are members of the church for a long time. They get the idea, well, this is not as important as something else. We kind of let that slip. Love doesn't act that way, folks. Love's concerned about all of it. When you think of Noah who building the ark, he might have thought, get the dimensions right, the window and the door and all that. But what difference does it make about the wood? Or we've got 99.999% of this thing made out of gopher wood, but right here this won't hurt to use this plank of whatever other kind of wood it is. And I love God. I've done all this other just exactly like he said do it. But the scripture says in Genesis 6, 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Why is that in your Bible? And since it was written a four time for your learning and my learning, what does it teach you about the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament, and the authority of Christ? The love that we all need for God is the love that always leads us to obey Him. If it's excusing you in your disobedience to God, you need to redo your idea of love. Because it's not the love we read about in the Bible. We've seen it when it comes to what the Lord had to teach in two different cases. One of them having to do with people who are dead and where they're beyond anything that can tamper with the way the Lord's work's done even involving the torment of a person. 
Let me, let me read one thing that just came to mind, if I can get there in a hurry. If you won't watch out, this will cause me to preach a whole other sermon. You don't want to do that. I heard all my life, because this ties into this, God hates the sin, and he loves the sinner. You ever heard that? And that we as members of the spiritual body of Christ should understand that. And I wonder, did they ever read Psalm 5 and verse 5? Psalm 5 and verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Now listen. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. You want to explain that away? You know, God doesn't just put sin into torment. He puts the people who committed into torment. He puts the people who spurned him and chose to do things their way and violated his will in the torment. That's the rich man. And every, I just wonder how many times people have gone in by the multiplied billions into torment and cried out at somebody across the great gulf because they remembered they had other folks back here on this earth saying, send somebody back over and warn him not to come to this place. Abraham or somebody else will say, they have the Christ and his gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Let them hear and believe and obey the gospel. Oh, no, no. But if somebody comes, no, it won't work that way. God knows what he's doing. God knows how, through the gospel, to find those who truly, from the heart, love him with all their being. And will put it into practice, even to the point of death. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 3.10. So before we come up and say some of these sweet, nice sayings, we better check them out with the Bible. I want to say this again. The Bible says concerning God's attitude toward those who sin, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Now, he doesn't want to say any of those people lost, but his love for them is not going to cause him to lower his standards to get them in. I'm not going to do it. People have the same plan of salvation. And people in the church have the same guidance to live faithful. It doesn't make any difference. Well, if you're subject to the call of Christ to become a Christian, what's your love like? Is it going to lead you to obey him no matter what you must sacrifice? I hope it will. If you need to obey the truth, won't you come now while we stand and sing?